The 60-foot racing trimaran, Great American, underdog in a race from New York around Cape Horn to San Francisco, was only a week away from the finish line when suddenly there was a mighty crash at the bow of the boat. It's a pretty good day. We're moving along about uh, 10, 11 knots, uh, 15, 16 knots of breeze, and all of a sudden, crack! I heard a loud whack, and I thought, whoa, we've hit something. Looked in the water to see what, what there was coming along the side of the boat, couldn't see anything, and all of a sudden, whack! Like a clap of uh, thunder, another sound, and before you knew it, there was a jib in the water, and uh, the headstay was flailing madly at the top of the mast. Uh, the headstay on Great American uh, had let go. In the 1850s, when all the world wanted to get to the gold fields of California as fast as possible, the clipper ships raced each other over the 15,000 miles from New York to San Francisco. The fastest ever was Flying Cloud, which twice made the voyage in 89 days. That record stood for 135 years. I'm Peter Rowe, with the story of an attempt to break the oldest record in sailing in this episode of Exploring Under Sail. With the headstay broken, skipper George Kolesnikov suddenly begins to see the record slipping from his grasp. Well, now it's going to be a little more difficult to stay on our current ETA. And it's, it's such a shame because we were just starting to really start piling the miles on in this stretch here. I, I, I think it's still doable. Uh, we can still plug along. We're doing eight and a half knots now uh, because it's blowing right at 15. But if it lightens up and gets down to 12 and 8 and 10 degrees, oh man, it's not going to be pleasant. We're going to be losing, we're going to be losing time, we're going to be you know, struggling to make headway. Uh, well, let's not think of that. As, as, we've, as we've done right from day one, uh, and as we proudly said, we, we every day we make the best of what is given to us. Kimball Livingston, sailing reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle define some of the reasons for the new interest in the Cape Horn record. The interest that we've seen, say, since 1981, when people started trying to beat the record, has a lot to do with the capability of the new boats and also the activities that have gone on in international sailing elsewhere. Uh, the Atlantic record, the transatlantic record, has been pushed lower and lower and lower until it's very, very difficult to beat that record now. The boats that you're using to come around Cape Horn really became technologically feasible only about 10 years ago. And before that, it would have been useless, really, to even attempt it. You weren't going to beat that 89 mark. By the time George Kolesnikov and crew Steve Pettengill are getting ready to leave in the dead of a New York winter, there have been over 250 challenges on the record. Crack British sailor Che Blythe tries three times. The first time he is dismasted. The second and third he capsizes and loses his boat. There's going to be a, a reception down here for some of the uh, mobile help people. In Californian Michael Kane tries, after unsuccessfully enlisting Beverly Hillbilly Buddy Epson's help in trying to find sponsorship money. Eric Kane, we've had some wonderful uh, comp uh, competitive races. And Mike approached me once because it, uh, he wanted to sail around the Cape Horn. And he was looking uh, for sponsors. I said, why don't you try Forest Lawn? <laughs> With Kane's attempt also ending in disaster, a famous funeral home almost seems an appropriate choice. But people keep trying. Now three boats, 
including one skippered by Florida boat builder Warren Lures, are out on the water, already rounding the horn by the time George and Steve, in the shadow of the classic ship Peking, prepare to set off. It's going to be tough. And it's standing here on the dock in this beautiful sunshine in Manhattan. Uh, it's one thing to s sit here and say, we'll put the pedal to the metal and we'll be there in 63 days. It's another thing, uh, what the Lord of the Ocean has in mind for us, we're going to find out over the next two months. Uh, so stay tuned and we'll let you know. I've got uh, two hours, two and a half hours since the tide, till the tide turns. I've still got some legal things to look after. I mean, that's the problem with this whole project. There has been no time yet to enjoy it. It's just stress, 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 rush, rush, rough, be abrupt, push people, push myself, just do it to get it to this point. And here we are, you know, almost a month late. The pressures of preparing, financing, provisioning, and organizing the voyage culminate in a crazy moment of nervous breakdown minutes before departure. And there are some things that I'm going to leave some people in the lurch about simply because I ran out of time in this last week. And I don't know why, but it's just making me... Oh, God! With that out of his system, the lines are cast off and Great American is on its way, though in a windless New York harbor, not yet looking like a record breaker. Once in the Atlantic, though, the boat is soon barreling along, the fastest sailboat of its kind in America at the time, the Great American's 3,700 square feet of sail can push it at speeds up to 27 knots. But there is no engine aboard, so like the clippers before it, and all other racing sailboats today, when the wind dies, as it must in the broad band of doldrums at the equator, so too does the speed. First sunset I really wanted to shoot because this is such a pretty one today. Steve and I are talking that if this was cruising, we'd say to each other, we had a favorite companion with us. This would not be half bad. But in terms of uh, record run to San Francisco, this is really getting to be the pits. We have no sink. Life progresses as Great American inches southward. Dishes are washed. Uh, you just kind of do the dishes here, and then you get a little fresh water, and rinse them, and take them down, and you're ready for another thing. So is hair. And uh, we just kind of, you know, do it. Food is prepared. Fish are caught. OK, watch the retrieving line. It is a barracuda. Yeah, not bad. We're going to be so stuffed already. And fish are eaten. We thank you, Mr. Tuna. We thank you, Lord of the Ocean. Let's eat. In the middle of a dark night, Great American collides with a mysterious object. The damage is repaired. Steve discovers seawater seeping into the omelets. Gallons are pumped out, lightening the boat and improving its speed. One of the uh, special treats of navigating across an ocean is that you get to change charts every couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending upon your progress. We've, uh, we're just about done with the east coast of South America, where we started out coming through the doldrums struggling, struggling, and struggling past the bulge, and then we finally got some speed, the 234 miles that we mentioned on day 25, that was in a stretch coming down from Recife, and we're now coming around to the next slant in South America before we head off to Rio de Janeiro, and it's kind of a nice treat to fold up a chart, look at the last one, and indicate that you're switching on to the, uh, the next page and start out with a blank piece, put on the next waypoint where you think you should be going after discussing it with Bob Rice, depending upon what's happening with the weather. And that kind of gives us a, we're here, we want to get in that general area. Then it enables us with the help of the satellite navigator and so on to, to steer a course 
um, that we will get this there with the greatest efficiency. They see hardly any other boats on the vast stretches of the ocean. But off the Falkland Islands, run through a huge fleet of silent, mysterious Chinese fishing ships. As the wind picks up off Argentina, so great America begins to move ahead of its past and present competitors. By April 20th, it is off Cape Horn, 40 days into the voyage, the fastest passage ever for a sailboat from New York to the Horn. today on Cape Horn Day will be a mountain chicken, chicken, veggies, and whole grain flakes and a delicate curry cream sauce. So we're going to have lunch and then we'll work our watches, you know, three hours on, three hours off during the day. I'm going to spend a little more time with the charts and reading the sailing directions and, and trying to enjoy something out of this day uh, because it's a it's a, you know, I'm not going to have a day like, it's the first time I've ever been around Cape Horn, uh, and doing it in my own boat, with my own uh, hands, as it were, of, uh, own funds, own efforts, uh, is all going to make it worthwhile. Um, and I'm especially reminded of, of the Chichesters and the Knox Johnsons and the Montessiers, my heroes, uh, people that I've read since uh, started reading about sailing stories uh, 20, 30 years ago, and they all came by here, and when I read about it, I thought, wow, Cape Horn, and uh, here we are, uh, moving along at about eight knots, and we'll be at the Horn, 17.5 uh, in about seven, eight hours, and a lot of parties laid on, we've got all kinds of special treats, uh, which you're going to have a chance to join us later. But like so many sailors before them, George and Steve find that conditions rapidly deteriorate once they round Cape Horn and head into the Pacific. It was quite remarkable how the somewhat benign nature of the Drake Passage, the relatively flat seas, the relatively light breezes, all came to an end literally, literally within minutes of our uh, prior to our arrival at, uh, at Cape Horn last night. If somebody had just thrown a switch, drawn a line, uh, and this was now a porn weather. It just changed dramatically uh, in minutes uh, from a very pleasant uh, evening sail to a very rugged uh, exercise, uh, reefing the main and uh, looking after other things. And then, of course, the, the motion uh, just continually never lets up. Let's not uh, mess with this, baby. Uh, Let's get the hell out of here as quickly as we can because we don't want any boat problems down here. We don't want any crew problems. We don't want any injuries. Uh, we, we just want to, at seven, eight knots, just keep pushing in the right direction and, and, uh, and get out of here because it's not a hospitable place. It's, it's cold and it's wet and it's windy. And I, I'd like to get out of here. Uh, so that the anxiety level will drop just a little bit. After rounding Cape Horn, Great American heads south and west towards Antarctica. It is a risky tactical move that will prove decisive in the race to San Francisco. As you can see on the chart for the last week or so that we're ahead of the first child of all boats. Crack crew, high tech boat, Boku bucks and thing, tremendously experienced skipper, and, uh, and she's almost 600 miles that away. And it isn't just the fact that she put it in the Falklands; it's the fact that we've been steady, and down at the Horn, we took a dive off to the south, and as Bob Rice pointed out, everybody else would have gone north and got boxed in against the coast. Uh, under those conditions, uh, I, I take some credit, and a lot of it was just sort of an instinctive feeling and some luck, because that's what I gathered and had to do to do it safely as well, is to go south and go west. 
After a sudden ocean scattering at sea and the ashes of Steve's favorite dog, he and George decide to strengthen their lead by searching the ship for anything else they can jettison over the side. We have really gone through the boat from the bow to the stern, looking at everything that we could jettison in order to cut down weight to give us that uh, lightness that is the mark of, of, of a performance multi-hull. And uh, we looked at some things that you, you know, otherwise would think that uh, we would certainly not never consider throwing over. Weights, about 40, 45 pounds of weight there. It's, of course, it's wet, so I think we have to jettison the other side. People have been trying to beat this record in modern boats since 1981, but the record really goes back about 135 years to a time when time was more than money, time was life itself, and the clipper ships were coming around the horn to the gold rush, and the fastest boat here made the most money. It was just about that simple at the time. Somewhere between 20, 25,000 voyages were made around Cape Horn from New York to San Francisco. Well, it's quite likely, though, uh, I'm going to be the guy that has captained the ship over this distance faster than anyone else in the history of mankind on Earth. Uh, some, of the, some of the great sea captains from that clipper ship era. Of course, they had different ships and all that, but it was still the sea and the wind and a bunch of men on a boat. So, you know, I, I think when I get to San Francisco, the incredulous of uh, George Kolesnikov with the help of Steve Pettinger uh, and this great, beautiful boat uh, taking this record, I, I think that's going to sink in. As the boat speeds towards San Francisco, the press, the winning began treated George as a long shot, an underdog. Now finally begin to take notice. Assuming now he will make it, the Commodores of the Manhattan Yacht Club fly to the West Coast with the Clipper Challenge Trophy. It's the hardest test in the world for yachtsmen. It combines all conditions, uh, from rounding Cape Horn, which is probably the most difficult area, to sailing in light airs, to an extreme endurance race. There's no other race like it in the world. If, if there weren't relatives and friends and business associates starting to gather in San Francisco, if we were just in a cruising boat, hell, that wouldn't really matter. We'd just hunker down, have a great dinner, and not worry about it, uh, and wait for the wind to change in the, in the morning. But uh, since we are in the record mode, uh, we've got to keep plugging away whether the wind is uh, contrary or not. George's parents? Dry and the paint didn't dry. You die out there at sea. Steve's wife doing what you want to do. and other supporters begin arriving in San Francisco. Hi, Steve, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to place a call to the vessel at sea, the great American. For me, the magic of the voyage, the magic spell of it all out here, has been kind of broken by having to start to attend to the shoreside and the San Francisco end of details, the logistics of where we're going to have the boat, where we're going to keep it, where we're going to do this, where the PR is, where the reception will be, which hotels people want to know. So I kind of had to look after some of these things, which has broken the spell. And, and most of all, I'm, I'm sorry that I've probably broken the inner voyage, the voyage that I was taking within myself, the conversation with the Lord of the Ocean. Really, really a blessing on me eve of my 47th birthday. I have the pure pleasure of sailing on the oceans of the world. It's a, it's a, it, for me, I love it everywhere. I wrote somewhere once, uh, you know, this is where I was born to be. The joy of ocean sailing in your own boat. And it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be right up there with, you know, with super sex and, and uh, moments of grace and a few other really deep experiences in life. But then with a crack, a broken headstay threatens the success of the voyage. But the crew jury rigs a replacement, and under reduced sail, continues to beat north toward the Golden Gate, 
with George praying that he and Steve will make it safely to land. As dawn breaks on their 76th day at sea, the fabled golden spires appear before them. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I give you the end of a golden string, wind it only into a ball, and it will lead you in through the golden gate built in Jerusalem's wall. Hallelujah indeed. And so, taking four days off Thursday's child's time and 13 days off flying clouds, Great American sails under the Golden Gate to a tumultuous reception in San Francisco Harbor. that I can't really remember, and probably there was no significant one thing. I just wanted to sail my own boat across big oceans. Uh, and I've wanted to do this uh, uh, for 30-odd uh, years now. So for me, this project, when I came sailing in through the Golden Gate, like, hallelujah! I mean, a major thing in my life happened. Uh, and uh, I, the fact that it's a record, the oldest record in sailing, is just pure gravy. <laughs> about it. I'm the luckiest man on earth. I am the luckiest man alive. Uh, for this, all this to happen to me, the voyage, the voyage, the challenge, the fun, the excitement, the adventure, and then maybe a, a, a all-time record to boot. <laughs> wow. After breaking the record, George Kolesnikov sold Great American to Rich Wilson who then sailed it with Steve Pepito to try and break the record run from San Francisco to Boston. In a huge storm off Cape Horn, the boat was capsized, the two men rescued, and the boat never seen again. George now lives in Canada, where he is making plans to head south again to explore, more slowly this time, the lonely land at the southern tip of the Americas. <laughs> 